how many of of course, a lot of people are older and they, they will still die from it, but we are making improvements. Cancer just happens to be one of those very difficult ones for medicine to, to overcome. So how can we expect science to overcome the transition from human to to computer if we can't solve the problems that we have now within the human race? Well, what's going to hopefully happen is that in the next 10 or 20 years, and I'm a full believer that we will, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, completely cure and eliminate cancer as well in the next 10 or 20 years, um, we will also, along this path, you know, transition into a society that loses its, its, what we might call its humanness, but it's going to keep the best parts of humanity. Because I don't ever think we're going to throw away our sense of perhaps uh, brother or sisterhood, our sense of love, our sense of loyalty, of mm-hmm. honor. I think we're going to keep the best parts, and hopefully, as we had talked earlier, throw away some of the bad parts, the ones where we war with each other, where we have constant conflict with each other. I'm hoping that we can kind of weed through that and uh, evolve ourselves into you know, a type of utopian society where um, a lot of the bad stuff has kind of fallen away and disappeared. Utopian society. I that would work if everyone was on the same playing field. But I don't see how being split between those who will live forever and those who are going to die horrible deaths is utopia. Yeah, no, I mean I I'm, I agree with you. It's difficult to see right now, mm-hmm. but you know globalization has started really sinking in, taking place. You can see it. And with it, a lot more people are getting access to modern medicine. Mm-hmm. Their, you know, mortality rates have certainly uh, dropped, and you know, um, and they're, and they're, you know, it's going to get better and better slowly. I just done a, an article where every single year people live, on average, the human race, one year longer, mm-hmm. and eventually that's going to become two years longer. And you know, hopefully, technology and science will take us to a place where we actually improve. I can tell you no one's ever going to be completely satisfied. It, you know, there's always going to be bad people out there that do dumb things and, uh, and good people that sometimes do wrong things. So, you know, it's never going to be a perfect system. I just hope it slowly spirals upward to make uh, everyone's lives better. But wasn't technology and science responsible for the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? They certainly were, and, you know, that's, they can do just as much damage. Mm-hmm. I am, you know, the Terminator scenario is real. It's, uh, we uh, just was discussing this with a scientist the other day. Mm-hmm. He works in artificial intelligence. He says with enough funding, we could have AI here. That means an entity that's as smart as us or smarter than us in 15 years. And that means that, wow, a species that's smarter than us, that's, that's actually very dangerous. And so we are going to have to be very careful how we handle that. Maybe it's something we actually don't want. Maybe it's something that society will go to the very edge and say, hey, there are some, there are some limits in the system that we're not sure we want to go down that path. And uh, maybe there will be other things that we will. Maybe it'll just be life extension that the human race will go after. And at some point we'll say, you know, we've gone too far technologically. We fear for the species' mm-hmm. sake. Tell me, what do you think the advantages would be for eternal life? Well, you know, one thing I can say about it is that everyone kind of always says, oh, well, it's going to get really boring, but um, I think they uh, underestimate how large the universe is. Uh, We could go, you know, a a Google amount of years, essentially, you know, trillions and trillions of years and light years, and still never experience everything in the universe, especially if it's expanding and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to exploring every nook and cranny of the universe, whether it's as a human being, whether it's as a transhumanist entity, maybe whether it's as a complete machine or just a form of energy, as a spirit, like could be something like that. So there's so many things out there that we can do, and that's why I want to live as long as possible. You know, talk about changing a career midway. Mm-hmm. I might have a million careers. But, you know, you say spirit, millions upon millions upon millions of people on this planet right now believe that when this biological body ceases to exist, its spirit, its soul moves on. The soul never dies. So isn't it possible that transhuman, uh, the transhumanist concept has already been accomplished by, a, by something called religion? Indeed, indeed. In fact, there is a character in my novel, uh, Zoe Bach, who represents that exact point of view. She's mm-hmm. like, look, 
there, and she's the most liked character in the novel. I'll tell you that by a long shot. The protagonist is kind of uh, angry and controversial, and no one really likes him. But Zoe Bach, everyone likes because she takes the spiritual perspective of transhumanism. She says, "Hey, we already are spirit. It doesn't matter if we live or die forever, because transhumanist aims are going to just end up at the exact same place as spiritual aims." which is this kind of greater mystic consciousness or this greater mm-hmm. mystic uh, experience. And um, yes, maybe, uh, maybe all the work of transhumanists is just going to lead to some um, somewhat glorious or somewhat, re- you know, a big giant revelation of something very spiritual. And I, I can actually endorse that. I've met a lot of spiritual people mm-hmm. and a lot of religious people recently who say, hey, it may be a Jesus singularity, it may be a singularity of consciousness, and maybe a, a mystic singularity, you know, singularity being that technological point in time when we saw, you know, we all just advanced so quickly. Mm-hmm. So uh, but, it could be many things like that. But if it is, like you were saying, and I kind of understand where, where we turn to spirit after all this transhumanist migration from human to computer and, and beyond, by going back to trying to put the human spirit or soul into a computer into a form of avatar, aren't we just going backwards? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this is a good story for my sequel, but perhaps that is the lesson that transhumanists or even people like myself need to learn is uh, we have, instead of just embracing something of the Spirit, mm-hmm. we have been always afraid. I mean, I'm afraid of embracing it. I, I'm too afraid of death, I, and I want to work to overcome it. But perhaps that's the lesson that people like myself or even the greatest scientists on the planet need to learn. Um, and so that's, this is where, again, this other side of my uh, ideas, and mm-hmm. you know, like I said, Zoe Bach and the novel, come out where it's maybe just leading to one another. Maybe it's just a spiritual lesson to teach uh, transhumanists that uh, they what they were working for had all long ago uh, existed. They just hadn't found it in the proper way. You know, so, that's, you know who knows? We'll, uh, we'll go down that path. You know, that's scary because uh, as you and I were discussing this possibility from spirit and so on, you know, if you were to take the, the part of Genesis where God said, and let us create man in our image and our likeness, it fits perfectly into transhumanism. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, when you compare some of the, the biblical things to mm-hmm. what is actually happening today, it, it gets a little scary. I mean, uh, you know, I grew up a Catholic, so I have a very detailed, uh, um, you know, knowledge yeah. of the Bible. And, uh, and, uh, and my book is essentially in, explores religion in depth. So I, I can tell you that the similarities, the coincidences are, are way too much. It's, it, you know, from just looking at it from a purely uh, statistical point of view, too many things are happening that sound similar. Mm-hmm. And again, this kind of goes back to, well, if this is how destiny is unfolding, perhaps there was some secret knowledge or something like that that transhumanists like myself can't see. Now, I don't see that, but uh, I'm open to, to, to learning if that's going to be the, the path I have to go down. I understand that the possibilities of eternal life, exploring the universe, every nook and cranny, it, it sounds so compelling. It sounds so adventurous. You're an adventurer. You're an explorer. You know, you, God, you, you go boarding down, the, down a volcano. I wouldn't even think of doing that in my wildest dreams. But anyway, for us people who are not as adventurous or we don't, I, I'm an explorer, but not not one who would like to spend the rest of their life exploring the universe or, or you know, like, I'm, I'm very happy knowing, and I've accepted this, that as a human being, the moment you are conceived is the moment you start to die. So I'm ready. No, and, you know, and that, I understand, you, you know, transhumanism is such a small movement at the moment. We're talking, you know, the the amount of people that are probably into it are, you know, millions. But mm-hmm. when you're talking about billions of people, I think that feel like you. Billions of people. My father, for example, mostly feels like, hey, I lived a good life, you know, but dying is also a part of life. Mm-hmm. It's just there are some of us that don't accept that. Some of us think non-existence is just simply unacceptable. But we, but you and, see, we um, don't know. Yeah. We don't know if it's non-existent after life. We don't know that. That's the beauty You're of right, life. It's filled either. with wonderment. 
Life is filled with wonderment. You know, I, I look at life like like the life of a of a caterpillar. You know, when we're here on this planet, on this dimension, we're a caterpillar. But when we die, we enter the cocoon and we come out a butterfly or, or, or our spirit is free. I don't think that if you look at science and science says you cannot destroy energy, we are energy. So whether we're put in a box, whether we are, you know, burned, uh, cremated, Whatever, after this biological unit ceases to exist, our energy, our soul, our essence lives on. So why would we want to encapsulate that and put it into a computer? I don't understand it. Some of us, from, I think, an emotional perspective, Mm -hmm. from a just genetic perspective, we don't, we just, it upsets me in such a thorough way to try to accept that my mind screams no this is the end there there might be energy but it's not my memories it's not my consciousness it's not my identity it's not zoltan everything that i want it to be and that's what i want to preserve i want to preserve that at all costs that's you know Let, why i wrote the novel it's why i you know zoltan i can under i, I, I can I understand that but god forbid and i say this with the greatest care and caution god forbid you're driving down the road tomorrow you get into an automobile accident. Your life is taken. That's the end of Zoltan on this plane. But what about what happens after you die and with all the people who have come back and talk about reincarnation, near-death experiences? That's food for thought. Let's talk about that when we come back from this commercial break. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. We'll be back on the other side of this break with Zoltan. Don't go away. With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go-bag, Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.whentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God, It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Thank you. 
Thanks, O Nation. This has been a great hour. My guest is...